And if you could turn to 1 Thessalonians. We'll pick up with... Verse 17, maybe somebody can tell me the page number in the Pew Bible. Not the most popular book, 1 Thessalonians. 1048. 1048. So before we read, let's, let's pray. Lord, as we consider your word and as you have... Uh, given your servant even a command to proclaim your word to, uh, to all creation and to the people of God, we pray that your uh, good hand and your spirit would be upon us here today as we consider and as uh, the word goes forth, may we receive it in faith and love and store it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives for the word of our God stands forever. So may we be convicted of that and encouraged in that and now uh, bless the uh, the preaching and hearing and working out of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 17, uh, this is the word of God. But we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, uh, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good, good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before uh, when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent uh, to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter has tempted you and our labor might be in vain." Amen. May God add richly to his word as we uh, consider it here today. As a particular church, a Calvary, this uh, particular church was founded on September 18th, 1938. That's now 83 years ago and one day, that is yesterday, was the uh, anniversary of the founding of this particular uh, body of Christ. And as a pastor, I began preaching uh, uh, September 16, 2001, 20 years ago, this past Thursday, in my preaching ministry at least. I was not installed until later. And that Sunday uh, that I preached my first sermon here, or as a called pastor here, was the first Sunday after 9-11. So 9-11 happened on a Tuesday, and then I preached here on that uh, Sunday. It's easy for me to keep track in, in, that, in that sense, when the planes were hijacked and World Trade Center and Pentagon, and one crashed a plane in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, let's roll after they said the Lord's Prayer, after Todd Beamer said the Lord's Prayer. And... What I'm suggesting, or more than suggesting, is that what happened on 9-11 was part of spiritual warfare. It wasn't merely a clash of nations per se, or a political issue uh, per se, or terrorists per se, but that it was part of spiritual warfare. And I say that in part, I'm not going to belabor this particular point long here uh, today, uh, but that on September 11th and 1683 is when the Ottoman Turks were at the gates of Vienna and they were stopped by the Europeans. And the suggestion that I'm making is that those who planned and worked out these attacks were very self-conscious as to the day that they chose 
And they chose a particular uh, day, not merely as a national, like to understand uh, geography and the ruling of nations, but that the Muslim Turks were stopped by Christian Europe at the gates of Vienna. And now as part of the West, the West, as part of Christendom, however corrupt we might be, however uh, corrupt we might be, is now pushing back, or you will, or attacking against uh, Christendom, or that which they would see as the Christian West. So it's spiritual battle or spiritual warfare. And I say that on this day, as in Calvary, in Calvary's history, uh, prior to me, Ray Miners, who here remembers Ray Miners? Who here was with Ray Miners, the first pastor, 42 or 43 years here? Tough shoes to fill. He and those with him, and some of you were here during his uh, ministry, focused on the reality of spiritual warfare. That is, that we are in the midst of doing battle with Satan and that we should be self-conscious uh, about that. So I'm going to preach about that here uh, today on this Lord's Day, this particular Lord's Day, September 19th, the year 2021, in the year of our Lord. So I picked a particularly, well, it, it may not be a passage that you think about much in First Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, to begin our discussion, but Paul wants to visit Thessalonica, the Thessalonicas, and, and he says, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. Or Satan stopped us in some translations. Or Satan blocked us. Or Satan prevented us. The Greek here has to do with impeding or detaining so that they were not able to do that which they wished to do. They were held back in the means by which the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that he was the reason why he could not get from A to B or he could not get to Thessalonica was because Satan got in his way. Satan, in some manner, held him back. Satan made it so that it, it could not uh, be uh, the case. And here, uh, Satan, what, uh, what the, uh, our, uh, our translations say, Satan, literally it is the adversary. Who is Satan? The adversary. If we wanted to go back to like, the literal meaning uh, of the Greek, Satan, the adversary, the devil. And Paul happens to be the meanest and the strongest and the most mature Christian you might find, we would argue, in all of history, right? The Apostle Paul, who through his ministry, the West was converted, right? That the gospel goes forth and he struggles throughout, but he is the man, the one that we look up to. He says, look, follow me as I follow Jesus, right? Mimic me as I, as I do what Jesus has to do. And the point being, if Satan stopped the Apostle Paul, if Satan made it so that the Apostle Paul was hindered in his ministry, might you think that there's a possibility that Satan might hinder you or I? Or hinder you or me? Right? If Paul, from the greater, if you will, like everybody would grant Paul's credentials, right? He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was hungry, you name it, and, 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 and then pressed through as a faithful Christian. If Paul struggled with, if you will, the, uh, the ministry of Satan, if uh, Satan stopped him, impeded him, blocked him, prevented him, uh, detained him, how much more so? Or should not we also be, be uh, considering that. And I don't think that that's something that we normally uh, think about, that we don't think in terms of that, that we don't consider our lives in terms uh, of that. Have you ever prayed that God would send his angels to watch over those whom we love? Have you asked God to deliver us from the, minion, or from the devil and his minions? Have we uh, paused to meditate upon the invisible, invisible glories that surround, uh, that, surround, uh, that surround us? And it's interesting, Barna, the, 
what would you call him, the surveyor, there's probably a better word for that, he's the one who goes out and takes polls, and he does that amongst Christians, and he says that a majority of Christians today, a majority of Christians do not believe in Satan and do not believe in the Holy Spirit. But that's part of the warfare that's going on even today. Uh, Mr. Johnson made reference, I think at the prayer meeting, but just how, so there was a law that was passed in Texas concerning uh, a, a, a relatively strict or stricter abortion law. And it was the Satanists who have in part been, been uh, arguing, uh, arguing uh, against this, the, against that law. The nicest people I've ever met, Satanists explains beliefs, plans to challenge Texas abortion law. Devil's advocate, are Satanists now the good guys in the fight against the evangelical right? So part of what's happened even within the church, but generally speaking, modern man over the last 300 years or so, we've become very scientific, very rationalistic, right? That we want to, uh, that we're not, uh, we don't believe in such things anymore. We don't believe in the devil and demons and witches or supernatural things or angels because we're rationalists and we're materialists and I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to touch it. I want to be able to put it under a microscope. But if I can't put it under a microscope, then it can't be real. It's, it's, it's outside of the purview of, of what, is, what reality is so that we've given up on, quote, spiritual uh, things and we've turned our, our backs to that and we don't want to be like some old-time uh, religious, uh, with, uh, the old-time religion with superstitions and believing in, in silly things like devils and pitchforks or whatever that, uh, that, uh, that might mean, uh, that that's not who we are. Uh, but I'll suggest, uh, more than suggest, uh, that uh, the Bible would have us to think in a different way than that, and that's what I'm trying to encourage us in here uh, today, that we are a part of a spiritual battle in the midst of a spiritual battle that includes angelic forces, that includes demonic forces, that includes uh, the, the Satan's satanic presence as part of that battle. And think about this then from uh, the perspective of the whole Bible, that the Bible begins with God making the heavens and the earth, the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. And what makes it so that they're not able to get back into the garden? Right. Cherubim. That is that there are angels who are protecting so that they might not enter into the garden again. That is, uh, that is an angelic presence, an angelic force. And throughout the book of Genesis, right, uh, angels arrived at Sodom and uh, Gomorrah. Think of how they ate with uh, Abraham or Jacob wrestled with an angel. Remember that account? And that's uh, to talk about our history here at Calvary, the associations with Peniel, because Jacob wrestled with an angel at Peniel. Uh, some of you don't... So there's a... Uh, a Christian ministry about an hour north of here that's name is Penile that had a strong association with Calvary Orthodox Presbyterian Church and very much so emphasizing spiritual warfare, fighting with the devil and so forth. Remember the account in 2 Kings 6? Some of you this will be familiar with, but the, king, the, uh, the Israelites were doing battle against the king of of Aram, and, and uh, he kept on losing. Like the Israelites kept on winning. And King of Aram says, what's going on here? Like, and they say, somebody on the other side is like giving data over, like selling intelligence info, if you will. So the King of Aram sends over an army like to go in and let's find this guy and let's Put him up on a noose or whatever we, they would do with him. And Elisha is with a man of God, a servant of God. He's with the, the servant of God. And next thing they know that they are surrounded by the Arameans. Lots of them. And the natural thing to do would be to say, oh no. Like, we be in trouble. Like, we be outnumbered. 
We're, we're in deep. How are we going to get out of this one, Elisha? Yeah, what do you got up your sleeve? And Elisha says, do not be afraid. O oh Lord, open his eyes so that he might see that those who are with us are greater than them. Right? Open up your eyes so that you would see, if you will, those angelic forces. And he opens up his eyes and the host of heaven surrounded them. And he sees the hill of hills full of horses and chariots of fire. And yet he could not see that with his natural eye. So 2 Kings 6, go home and read that. It's a great, it's a great account. Or 1 Kings 22, Micaiah and Ahab. I told the story a couple of weeks ago. Remember that uh, the, uh, Ahab was the one who had armor on and the spear uh, went in or the arrow went in when it was, when it was uh, shot uh, randomly and, and so forth. But during that uh, dialogue, Micaiah, who was the, uh, who was the faithful prophet, is, is discussing with the Lord, and we read, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him. The Lord in heaven with the multitudes of the heavenly host uh, uh, around him. Uh, standing around him on his right side and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth, Gilead, and go to his death there? One suggested this and one suggested that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. The Lord said, By what means? I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. He said, you will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord, go and do it. So what's happening in the council of heaven? The Lord sends out a spirit in order to bring about his purposes and to bring about his, heaven, his, uh, his ends, I should say. Saul, the spirit of the Lord departed and an evil spirit, spirit tormented him. He needed some good music. David. And then you get to the New Testament and you have the angels proclaiming what is happening and what will happen. That is that, Mary, you're going to give birth and, and this, this is going to be like no other, no other child. And when Christ, the Christ uh, uh, child is born, you have the angels there proclaiming glory to God in, in heaven and on, on earth. That, there's, that it is a spiritual battle. That the, that the angels are involved. And then the Spirit of the Lord comes down upon Jesus in His baptism. And what's the first thing that happens? And this is not by chance when you read your Bible. The Bible is not just all thrown together so that, oh, we'll just like go to this entry next and that entry next that Jesus is baptized, he's baptized, the Spirit comes upon him, and the next thing that happens that we read about in Matthew is that he is in the desert, and who comes to knock on the door while he's in the desert? Satan himself. And Satan tempts him. And Satan says, let me show you the short way to becoming great and to get glory. And the Lord responds, but it is written, but it is written, but it is written. And then throughout the, uh, throughout the gospel accounts, you have evil spirits. And uh, we're reading the evil one will snatch, uh, will, will snatch uh, particular uh, individuals or snatch them uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the truth. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, Is it only by Beelzebub? The prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So what was Jesus doing? He was driving out demons. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions until he first ties up the strong man? Or in the parables, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. What happens to particular individuals, right? that they hear the Word of God, that in some way uh, that it's in their heart. And Jesus says, you know what happens to some people when they have the Word of God in their heart? That the evil one comes and snatches it away, somehow makes them compromise, somehow makes it so that they would not believe in the Word of God anymore, that it would no longer have effect in their lives. They would say, oh, that was when I was a little kid, or that was when I was silly, or that was then, but now is now, and I no longer need that Word that was proclaimed to me. And why? The point here? Because the devil snatched it. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you. 
sift you like wheat. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. John 8, who is your father? He's speaking to the Jews and their unbelief and their murderous, uh, their murderous intentions. Your father is the, is the devil. Your father is the devil. The book of Acts, which is all about spiritual warfare in the heavenly realms. And Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit in Acts 5? In Acts 13, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil. You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. There are passages that are, they don't seem really like spiritual warfare, but just, it just worked into the, it's weaved into the text. You wouldn't even necessarily uh, think about it. So Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he's writing about husbands and wives, to, and he's, or he's speaking, I mean, he's writing to the Corinthian church, and now he's speaking uh, to husbands and wives in this particular text, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, 7 verse 5. Do not deprive one another. And he's talking sexually. Except perhaps by agreement for a limited time so that you would devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again. Why? So that Satan might not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is a good thing. There may be a time to pause, but be careful that you don't pause too long. Why? Because of the work of Satan. Because how Satan might lead you astray. Later in that, or in the second, his second letter to the Corinthians, these surpassing great revelations. So Paul has these, these uh, revelations. In order to keep me from being conceited, however, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. So we can say, and this is uh, a good part of this is quotation. So we can say, Satan is a person. He cannot be rationalized away as a pre-scientific myth or literary personification he moves, 1 Peter 5. He works, Ephesians 2, 2. He knows, Revelation 12. He speaks, Matthew 4. He plots, 2 Corinthians 2. He desires, Luke 22. He disputes in Jude 9. He deceives in 2 Corinthians 11. He feels emotion in Revelation 12 and, and following. He tempts, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. That's what we read. He makes promises, Matthew 4. Uh, that's Jesus in the desert. He sins, 1 John 3, 8, and engages in many other activities of a personal nature. When he fell, he led astray a host of angels with him, as Jude 6 indicates by mentioning a plurality of apostate angels. Not content with simply uh, this following, Satan also applied himself to the project of winning man's disobedience, a disobedient allegiance to him. That is, that the job of the devil is to win you over to himself and that he's a slanderer, he's the evil one, he's the adversary, he's called the enemy, the accuser, the destroyer, and the world ruler of darkness. And they recoil from him as a liar and a murderer, and is the angel of the bottomless pit, the roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, a dragon, a Revelation 12, and that old serpent in Revelation 12, a 9. He represents nothing good, uh, nothing profitable, nothing constructive, and that there's not only him, but, and, and not only angels of God, but that there are angels of Satan, Matthew 25. These are de designated demons, and the New Testament accounts of demon possession are plenteous. 52 instances in the Gospels, the word demonic occurs 55 times, and then we find the phrases unclean and evil, evil spirits. And yet, most Americans do not believe that Satan exists. No, let me qualify that. Let me make sure I get that right. It's not just that most Americans don't believe that Satan exists. It's that most Christians don't believe that Satan exists. So 
So this quote comes from, uh, there are various sources, I'm not sure what's the right one, but anyway. Uh, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not exist. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not or does not exist. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. And chapter 3, verse 5, For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent uh, to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. The tempter had tempted you. So two references here in First Thessalonians 2 and 3. Therefore, this is what I want us to consider then in light of that. Number one, pray with all earnestness and zeal when you pray the Lord's Prayer that thou might deliver us from the evil one. Right? But that's in the Lord's Prayer. So some translations say deliver us from evil. I think that's probably what we say on, in our uh, when we recite that, uh, some translations will say, uh, deliver us from the evil one. Most literally it is, it is deliver us from the evil. The evil. Right? That we would pray in recognition of the reality of evil and the evil one, that we would pray as a church, that we would pray individually, that we would pray in the morning, that we would pray around our tables, that we would be self-conscious, that, Lord, that you would deliver us from the evil one, that we would pray the Lord's Prayer with a certain sense of zeal, not only that portion of the Lord's Prayer, of course, but that we would be mindful that we need to pray, that we are dependent upon God, that that's when we're at our strongest, when we say, Lord, you better help me because I know how, how easy it it is for me to go down the wrong road. I know how easy it is for Satan to have control over me, to just put darkness over my mind and darkness in my heart and to think in a crooked way or a way that's not mature or not what God would have us to do so that we pray, oh Lord, deliver us from the evil. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. Even, even if you're, uh, so the, the uh, perhaps the there are lots of good testimonies of, of Christianity and the Christian faith uh, with, uh, with what happened in 9-11 uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but perhaps the, well, I'll just say, uh, perhaps my favorite is when Todd Beamer, a graduate of Wheaton and a believer, is on, uh, and he knows what's going to happen, and he's talking to, and I'm not even sure now who he was talking to, some representative, either from the airline or something along those, those lines, and he says, would you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? And other accounts of people saying, uh, 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 would you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? A woman coming out of uh, coming out unable to see. I, I watched uh, something uh, last week or the week before. She came out of the, I forget which tower, she could not see, and someone coming to minister to her, and she's saying, I, I don't know, I, I think, am I going to die? Am I going to die? And I'm, Am I going to die? And finally she asks the person who's helping her, would you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? So I ask you that you would pray it with urgency and sincerity, especially on this day, Deliver us from the evil one or the evil. Number two, uh, your baptism is a declaration of war against the evil one. 
Your baptism is a declaration of war against the evil one. Luther said in his uh, baptismal ceremonies, Therefore thou miserable devil, acknowledge thy judgment and give glory to the true and living God. Give glory to his Son, Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Ghost, and depart from uh, uh, this particular person, his servant. For God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has of his goodness called him to his holy grace and blessing and to the fountain of baptism, so that thou mayest never dare to disturb the sign, disturb the sign of the holy cross uh, which we make on his forehead through him cometh again to judge therefore thou miserable devil keep away from my saint and may this saint know that he has declared war against satan himself if you have not been baptized you should be baptized and believe in the lord jesus christ and if you have been baptized that means that you have made a declaration against satan and against his minions Number two, number three, speaking of Luther and the devil, quotes, the devil fears the word of God. He can't bite it. It breaks his teeth. Come, let us sing a psalm and drive away the devil. So over and over again, he's very aware of the devil. The best way to get rid of the devil, if you cannot kill it with words of Holy Scripture, is to rail, rail at and mock him. Music, too, is very good. Music is hateful to him and drives him far away. Number three, speaking of Luther, number four, Paul warns us not to be joined with him in darkness, uh, especially in marriage. Quote, 2 Corinthians 6, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, that is Christ and the devil, the Christ and, and the minions of the devil? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? So the warning then, Paul says, look, that Belilah, that the devil himself would warn you that you may not be united with one who does not confess Christ. That you must not be joined in a manner that's inconsistent with your Christian profession. That that is the, well, I'll just, this is what I want to say. That is the most important thing for our children to comprehend. Not to be yoked and dragged. And it's not only in marriage that we would, uh, that we would, uh, that we would say that. That's number four. Uh, do not be yoked with unbelief. Number five, uh, unbelief, that is Belila, that is the devil. Number five, remember that the devil is a liar and that no wonder for Satan himself masquerade, masquerades as an angel of light. He always makes it look good. He always makes it look tasty. The apple or the fruit looked so good. It looked so tasty and it promised so much freedom. And to think that that's not, that's the same mojo that happens today. That he makes it look beautiful. That he makes the way of sin look like it's somehow paradise. When it is not paradise, but leads our souls to death and to Hades and to hell. He masquerade, masquerades as an angel of light. Number six, so that we should use the weapons that God has given us. And I quote then from Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The strategies of the devil. You know how you need to do that? You need to put on the full armor of God. You need to be given over to that which would mature you as a Christian to make you uh, aware as a Christian. Not merely reading the Wall Street Journal or whatever other literature you might read, but that you would be sharpening your skills and your tools as a Christian and as a believer. Put on the whole armor of God, putting on that armor. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You think you got a high calling this week? So take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Which is the Word of God in the song that we're going to sing after uh, this sermon. One little word will 
fell him. Martin Luther, one little word were fell him. That, that is that we would be in the word and praying always with all prayer, supplication in the spirit, being watchful uh, to this end, that we would pray at all times, that you realize that we are in one level in over our heads in our own power, that we're always calling out to God, that we're always saying, Lord, if you're not with me, I will turn, I will turn the wrong way. I won't have the maturity uh, that I, I need to have, uh, that the word would be snatched out of, uh, out of uh, my heart. And so number six, use the weapons that God has given us. And then number seven, with confidence, knowing that he who is with you is greater than the enemy. This is not some defeatist sermon. This is not some sermon that we all should be running away with our, our, our tail in between our legs, our figurative tail in between our legs, saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. No, that we are to have confidence in the living God, that in and through Jesus, that Satan has been defeated. That he who is with you, that when we, we, we pause, if you will, and the Lord opens up, if you will, the gates of heaven, we see all, uh, if you will, the, uh, the power and the glory that we have. Uh, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. To destroy the devil's work. So number seven, then know with confidence. Number eight, then submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That you would be self-conscious about that. That I am going to resist. That I am tempted. That if you are like me, or to say if you are like Adam, or if you are like any uh, one of the other seven billion people on the earth today, or the however many billion have lived uh, before, that you are tempted to do things that the tempter is active and working, that you are tempted to yell at your wife, that you are tempted to yell at your husband, that you are tempted to steal, that you are tempted to be lazy, that you can list out the temptations. They are many, but the Scriptures say what? That we are to resist the devil, that we are to resist the devil, and then he will flee from you. It actually gets easier at one level, if properly understood. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will... Uh, he will he will uh, flee uh, from you. That was number eight. And then uh, number nine, stand with Jesus. So even though the devil is known as the accuser, right? I am. The, he accuses. He accuses. My dear children, I write to this so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. The accuser has been refuted. So some of you probably, uh, maybe all of us, right? We feel guilty at one level. Oh, I can't believe this happened on Thursday night. I can't believe this is what I'm thinking about that person. And so forth. Repent, yes, but confess it to Jesus, knowing that Jesus is making intercession for you. That you would be confident. And he makes that through his church. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So that's the message. Know that Jesus disarmed the rulers, this is uh, Colossians 2, and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over, uh, over uh, them in him. That is, our great captain has won the contest. The seed of the woman has bruised the head of the serpent, but the serpent has been crushed. Hearken now, thou miserable devil, adjured by the name of the eternal God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and depart trembling and groaning, conquered together with thy hatred, so that thou shalt have nothing to do with these servants of God here today. You, the people of God. So be encouraged in that, strengthened in that, as we resist the devil and uh, submit to God and look to Jesus and to the scriptures to find faith in life. So let's pray. Oh Lord, if it was left to us, there would be no victory, but in Jesus there is victory. 
So may we see ourselves as part of this spiritual battle. So grant us the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit and prayer, being watchful in such things. As we wrestle, O Lord, may you grant us, O Lord, all that's needed so that we might remain faithful to the end and be part of the building up of your kingdom. In Jesus we pray, amen.